Welcome back. We are doing our series of youth group notes so that if you miss a lesson, uh, you still know what we're talking about. So this time we are going to talk about Jesus's hometown. Yay, how exciting. Okay, so um, he grew up in Galilee. And so we're gonna talk about the Galilean hill country. I'm gonna show you a picture. This is out of Collins Atlas of the Bible. Okay, so this is, hopefully you can see that. Uh, this is a map of the region he grew up in. Uh, Josephus, who was a famous historian later, just a little bit later, he divided Galilee into Upper Galilee and Lower Galilee, but for our purposes today, we're just gonna kinda talk about the whole region. Um, so Galilee, Galilee, oh boy, here we go. Galilee was a northern province of Palestine. Um, it started being under Rome's purview, under their um, power structure in 57 BC. Um, they're actually surrounded by Greek cities and the Greeks did have an influence on Galilee, but it was still very much um, emphatically even Jewish. It was still very much, this is a Jewish province, this is a Jewish area. I used to think Galilee was a town. Uh, it was actually made up of 204, some say, sources say 275, but about 204 cities and villages. Um, and that is according to Josephus. And he was saying in 66 AD, which if we recall, Jesus went to heaven in about 33 AD, somewhere in there. Okay, so this is about 30 years after Jesus has, has left the earth. Okay, um, their favorite lake. No, not their favorite lake. Oh my goodness. Okay, hello, here we go. Uh, the lake that they refer to as the Tiberius which is what we call the Lake of Genesaret. That is famous for fishing. It was famous for fishing in their day. Um, okay, so we're gonna go over to John 4, and we're also gonna go to Luke 4. So John 4, 43 through 45, and then right on the heels of that, Luke 4, 14 through 15. Okay, so John 4, 43 through 45. Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his home country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. Okay, so some people from his hometown saw him performing signs and miracles in Jerusalem at the feast. And so yes, great, he's coming home and he's gonna perform miracles here. They were so excited, right? Okay, let's go ahead and go to Luke 4, 14 through 15. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. The news of him went through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Okay, so a synagogue. This was the center of religious life for a Jewish person. Um, the whole village would attend the synagogue. Now, uh, synagogues kind of rose to importance at that time. Remember we talked about Babylon and the Jews being deported, um, and then... So first Assyria, then Babylon, well, the Northern Kingdom, Assyria, and then this other kingdom, Babylon. But anyway, Assyria, Babylon, and then um, good King Darius uh, with the Medes and the Persians. Okay, so that was Persia then took over. Okay, so, and then all of that, when Babylon came in and dispersed the Jews and, and took them, they ransacked the temple. So that was the, that was the temple that Solomon had built and it was gone. Well, there is kind of a 400 year gap, if you will, between the dispersion and then they come home and they resettle and they rebuild the temple and it's fine. Um, but then when the New Testament picks up, this temple is Herod's temple. And this has taken over 30 years for uh, the Jewish nation to build, right? Okay, so synagogues were like your local church Yes, the temple in Jerusalem would have been like the center of their religion. It would have been the most important, but your local synagogue, um, that would have been very, very important. And it grew in importance when the Jewish nations did not have, or the Jewish nation did not have that central location to worship. So that was part one. Part two is the synagogue is where, yes, you're meeting every week. This is the whole village is gathering for religious instruction, for worship, for prayer. Um, it's also where Jewish boys would have been educated. So it's also their school, okay? Um, 
being in community, this was a time where if you were not in community, you simply would not make it. Um, you had to be in community, right? Because you couldn't just go buy your food. You had to either grow it or have someone to trade with. Um, same for tools and implements and clothing. If you're not producing it at your home, then you need to have the ability to trade with someone else to produce that or, you know, so that they, they someone else that produces it, trade with them or barter or buy from them. Community was a very big deal. Um, they're also surrounded by wilderness country. And so yes, the threat of bears and lions was very real. We see that from different uh, accounts of shepherds. and. <laughs> Our favorite shepherd David you know talked about how he killed a lion and a bear trying to keep his sheep safe so all that to say community was very important being kicked out of the synagogue would have been devastating um, we are gonna get into that when uh, that kind of comes up later but so the synagogue is, is a very important it's it's the heart and soul of, of their town in a way that our modern minds kind of have a hard time understanding if we're familiar with uh, maybe Little House on the Prairie and how their school was their church and everybody was so spread out but you know coming together to worship or coming together for a civic meeting or coming together for those activities was really um the, the community experience that would have been basically the only community um you would have had so i think our modern minds have a hard time kind of understanding just how important the synagogue was but we're gonna we're gonna leave that there for right now and kind of move on Okay, so John 4, 46 through 47. I'm going to read that to you real quick. So, Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water, the water into wine. Remember that? Okay, we just studied that a couple weeks ago. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judah into Galilee, he, uh, Judea, sorry, into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. Um, so Jesus's miracles at this point, they're the topic of conversation. Everybody around the whole region, like we talked about, I showed you the map, 204 cities and villages, everybody's talking about Jesus's miracles, okay? So let's go on down to 49 through 50. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, um, go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Okay. That was by the way, out of the new King James version. Okay. Um, so I love this miracle. I think it's so interesting because of two things. Primarily Jesus doesn't actually do what he asks this dude, this nobleman, he asked Jesus to come with him. Jesus doesn't do it. He doesn't even say, Hey, I'm not going with you. He says, go your way, your son lives. Okay. So he doesn't do what the man asked, but he does do what the man wants, right? Because ultimately the man just wants his son to be healed. Like he is operating from the idea of like, Jesus has to be in the room to heal him. And he doesn't, he absolutely doesn't. So Jesus does heal the son, but he doesn't go with him. Okay. So this man leaves trusting that Jesus did what he said he was going to do, but there's no proof. Like, yes, we know later. Okay, so he did heal him, but there's no outward sign when the guy leaves. The dad has to go home, assuming that Jesus has healed his son. So can you imagine that journey? Like, okay, like I, I think of when he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and, and the guy says, you know, I do believe, help my unbelief. I, I feel like this father might have been in a similar situation. Lord, I trust you, help me trust you because I have to leave you my only hope of, of saving my son, I have to leave you and go home and you're telling me my son is well and he's going to be well when I get there. That takes a lot of faith. Okay, so the man leaves. He's trusting Jesus, that Jesus did what he said he would do, uh, but there's no proof or outward sign. Um, and I think it's funny because I skipped 48 and I skipped it intentionally because I wanted to read this to you. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will by no means believe. So in the context of this, Jesus is telling the people of his hometown, you guys need to stop trusting in signs and wonders. I am performing these miracles, but you're trusting in the miracles themselves instead of me. Oh, do you see the fly? Okay. Anyway, so the context of stop just trusting the signs and the wonders is the same context that Jesus does the thing. He does the healing, but there's no outward sign to accompany it. I just find that so fascinating. Luke 4 16. 
Um, so he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Okay, so we've talked about the Sabbath a couple times before, but so every the sixth day, well, so it's complicated. For us, it would be our Friday night through Saturday night is what uh, the Jewish uh, Sabbath would be. Um, Christians started worshiping on Sunday because that was the day Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, so all that aside, Sabbath. The tradition when you would go to synagogue is you would have seven men would stand up and well, so, so you stood up to read, okay? You'd read a portion of scripture and, and it's not the Bible, it's, it's scrolls, okay? Um, but anyway, they would unroll it and they would read and, and Hebrews left to right, which is backwards for us, but whatever, right to left. Don't quote me on that. Hebrew is different from how we read. We read left to right, it goes right to left. Anyway, um, tradition was you would stand up to read and then you would sit down to explain or teach the passage that you just read. So you would usually have seven men, they would go up and they would stand there and they'd read from the scroll. So as a teenager and a young man, Jesus would have done this, right? This is his hometown, this is the area he grew up in. He would have been one of the men to read from the scroll. So none of that's like uncommon. So just like um, when our college kids come home from college, we want to make sure they have a part in the worship service or they have um, something that we, so we can kind of say, hey, we missed you. You still belong here. You may not be here every week, but you still belong to this church, okay, or this community or whatever it is. You still belong. You're still part of our family. They would have, in a similar vein, that would have been Jesus, okay, I'm, I'm home. I'm going to read the scroll. Okay, so let's go down just a little bit to Luke 4.23. And actually, I'm just going to tell you. So in Luke 4.23, we know that the people are checking out the miracles. We know that they've been talking about them. We know that they saw them when they were up at the festival in Jerusalem. They're anxious to see Jesus do a miracle. Jesus, do something cool in your own hometown, right? So while we're talking about this, Jesus would have um, been reading to the people in Hebrew and there would have been a, an interpreter in Aramaic, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go back to Luke 4, 18 through 21. So this is actually like what Jesus was saying. So he's, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, so um, if we go down one more verse to the 22, oh, I actually stopped a little bit before I meant to. Um, I'm gonna read it out of here. So this is the NIV. the delay all right here we go i want this this section right here um the, so verse starting verse 20 we're gonna go 20 to 22 then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fast on him i bet they were he began by saying to the, them today the scripture is fulfilled in your healing okay that part some of them would have interpreted that as blasphemy okay so that part's kind of dangerous all, but right here, it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. And here's where it gets a, a little, little dicey. Jesus said, surely you'll quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do you hear in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum? Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. This is Psalm 24. I assure you, there are many widows in, in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years. There was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but a widow in Zarephath, the region of Sidon. And then he goes on. And then verse 28, check this out. They were just praising him. They were just super looking forward to his miracle, saying he's a gracious teacher, all that great stuff. And verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the cloud and went on his, the crowd and went on his way. Okay, so they're amazed at him and then the insults start flooding in and then it gets so heated that they're ready to kill him. They're 
you're ready to commit murder. Um, we're going to pause on that and I want us to examine some of his claims. Um, so what is he claiming? He's claiming to give hope to the poor and the underprivileged. How did he do this? Was he successful and do his efforts continue to this day? He said he would cap set the captives free and liberate people. Did he? And is he still liberating people and setting them free? And if so, how? He said he gave sight to the blind. Did he do this? And was it just physical sight or were there other components as well? He said he was releasing the oppressed. How has he done this and has it helped? And what is the day of God's grace and what on earth is the year of Jubilee? Okay, and those will be our discussion questions. So thanks for watching and see you soon.